Our next speaker is somebody I know pretty well. She actually worked with Dr. Atkins for over three decades. So pretty rare uh, that she's out there uh, in the real world kind of seeing patients and has been. So she's been a regular on my low carb cruise. I'm gonna give a quick plug for the low carb cruise. Who in here has been on the low carb cruise? Both of you, thank you. And uh, so the rest of you, uh, it's uh, gonna be in May 2018, May 20th through the 28th, 2018, lowcarbcruiseinfo.com if you're interested. But one of our staples is our next speaker here. Her name is Jackie Eberstein, and I actually asked her to do this specific talk a couple of years ago on the Low Carb Cruise, and it's the all-time most listened to talk from the cruise. So I think you're going to enjoy it here today. She's going to talk about barriers to weight loss. Nobody has that problem, right? Come on. Ladies and gentlemen, Jackie Eberstein. She's not quite ready yet. <laughs> so controlledcarb.com is her website if you want to check out uh, the work that she's doing. But she literally saw all the patients that Dr. Atkins uh, had in his clinic. Uh, she got a hold of them first before he got a hold of them and uh, was able to help them with their, their issues. And literally, if you want to know anybody that knows more about the Atkins low-carb ketogenic approach, it's this lady right here. So once again, Jackie Eberstein. Thanks, Jimmy. Well, hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me in the back? Good. I can't see any of you. I'm, I guess this is how actors feel with all the floodlights in their face and they have no idea whether their audience is still there or not or if they're awake or not. So, um, uh, the green button. Okay, hopefully that's the green button. Okay, I'm gonna talk about barriers to weight loss, but I'm gonna start out by saying I hate the word weight loss because it isn't about losing weight. You could lose the wrong kind of weight. It's about losing the excess body fat. It's really about fat loss. And that's what I really want to hope you're going to leave with today, is please don't have this love affair with your scale, because it often, it, well, it often isn't. It isn't the most accurate reflection of fat loss. Body fat percentage, loss of inches, and that's what you want to concentrate on. Okay, I guess there's this clicker fatigue. Oh, okay. Now this is one reason why you may not be losing body fat. Oh no, I'm retaining chocolate. So I hope that doesn't apply to any of you. So in order to have what I think is a, a healthy um, way of eating so that you can turn a diet into a lifestyle for a number of reasons, so you can break your pattern of yo-yo dieting, and I know a lot of you out there have gained and lost and gained and lost a lot of weight, and this remote still isn't working. Okay. Is I think you have to have a, a plan or a program that addresses all of these issues, and I think that a low-carb ketogenic diet does that. Um, first of all, it has to improve your health and well-being. You notice that that was not, the top of my list was not your weight. It has to improve health and well-being. Supports your metabolism and normalizes risk factors. And again, it's your metabolism. And we know there are certain people out there, we've talked about it uh, these last couple days, who are insulin resistant, who have diabetes, who have metabolic syndrome, who maybe had gestational diabetes um, during pregnancies. You are the people, or PCOS, you're the people who's gonna, who are do, going to do better by controlling your carbs. You want a diet where you include whole, minimally processed foods that are readily available. You don't have to buy meals um, ready-made. You don't have to buy exotic ingredients. You can get any of this anywhere. And it gets you off of all the highly processed foods that contain so much of the things that we really don't want you to have, like the seed oils, the refined flours, and a lot of other um, chemicals that when you read a label, you can't even understand what they are. It should include satisfying foods. You should have control of your hunger and cravings. If you don't, then you're not really stabilizing your metabolism, and you're not going to be able to live that way. No one should ask you to live your life in order to lose body fat, always being hungry. Allows you to eat in between meals if you are hungry. 
if you're on a low-calorie diet and it's 7 o'clock and you've had your calories for the day and you're still up for several hours, and if you're hungry, you're stuck. Either you go off your program, increase your calorie intake, or you go to bed hungry. You don't have to do that here. It's about learning when you need to eat and how much you need to eat. And it does make it easier to lose or to maintain weight. So, are you really on a plateau? Now, we always use the word plateau, but a lot of the common vernacular now, it's I'm stalled. My weight loss has stalled. You're only on a plateau or you're only stalled if you haven't lost any weight or inches in four weeks. So we would have people getting very upset. I'd have patients call me on the phone. In the last two weeks, I've lost 10 pounds. This week, I've only lost two. I'm already failing. I'm stalled. No, you're not. What you need to do is to get rid of your inappropriate expectations about how this scale works. And so what I need to do in my job, and this is what you need to start to do with yourself, if you're someone who starts to feel like you're failing, is you have to begin to look at a longer view. First of all, ask yourself, are you feeling better? Well, if you're feeling better, that's all the more reason to continue doing what you're doing. You will break through your stall, if it is a true stall. Are your clothes lo looser? Are you losing inches? If that's happening, you are shrinking your fat cells. And you're getting all that stuff we've talked about here, the triglycerides and everything else, out of your fat cells. That is more accurate. That's why I think it's important that you take measurements every two weeks. So you really have a more accurate reflection of how your fat cells are shrinking. Are you still in ketosis if you're measuring, measuring ketones? Um, if you're not, then what you want to do, or if you're also getting hunger and cravings again, then what you want to do is you need to take a look at what you're eating. But there's something very important. Don't allow a plateau to sabotage your best efforts. You will break through a plateau. You just need to be patient and continue to do the right thing. But you can also start to examine what you've been doing and find out you may be making some mistakes. So what can interfere with weight loss? Lots of things can. And I probably haven't gotten everything on these next two slides. But frequent deviations. And I don't agree that if you're doing low carb, you can have a cheat day. Um, that simply, in my view, is not going to work, especially if you're a carb addict, because your cheat day, obviously, is going to be loaded with all your favorite carbs. So you're going to re-trigger that reward center in the brain, and you don't want to do that. Um, you may very well start really increasing your blood glucose, and we all know why that's a bad idea. And you can also start increasing insulin production. And depending upon what you ate, you might take several days before you actually start to normalize those levels again. And you can lose your ketones for up to four or five days, depending upon what you ate and how much of it you had. So that if you do that, um, you may have a rocky few days. But learn from that and stop with the frequent deviations. Carb creep is something that's, oops, OK. Carb creep is something that's very common. You start overdoing your allowable foods, um, especially nuts and cheese. And I will tell you, those are two reasons why you can really get stuck. Part of the reason is they're hard to control the amount you eat. Another reason is, is they can be high in calories. And so for me, I don't really trust myself a lot with nuts. I buy them occasionally, and I will count out my 12 almonds, and then that's all I can have. Um, it took me a long time to develop that kind of discipline, because once I started eating, especially with something that's crunchy, and there's not a lot of crunchy things on low carb, you, you really want it to have more, so you need to be careful there. You don't want to do your own version of low carb. Um, a lot of people never even read the books or learned how to do low carb correctly. They asked their friend who was successful, and their friend told them how they did it. That may or may not work for you. So one of the things you want to do is make sure you know how you're supposed to be doing your program correctly. So read the books, go on the internet, whatever. Um, but get all the facts. There can be hidden carbs in prepared foods. Low-fat products. We all know that low-fat products are higher in glucose. They add stuff so that they taste better. Improper use of low-carb products. And I don't feel people, especially at the beginning of their program, should be using any low-carb products. You really want to be using whole, minimally processed foods. 
Diet food, of course. Diet food is usually, it can have a lot of sugar alcohols. <clears throat> it may have a lot of sources of protein that you may not want. Um, it could also be lower in fat, but higher in carbs. So those are things that you want to take a look at whether you're doing it and whether that can be several of these things could be a reason why you may be stuck. What else can interfere? Now, we've heard about this one, and this one for a lot of people is a huge one. It, this has been one for me all of my life, and that's chronic stress. Um, the production of cortisol, the production of the sympathetic, of the hormones that, that are part of the sympathetic nervous system that John just talked to you about. That can affect where you deposit fat, how much, you, how much you're gonna deposit fat. It can affect your blood sugar, making your blood sugar more unstable, and that brings a whole lot of other issues as far as being able to more comfortably follow your plan. So having a plan to deal with chronic stress is important, and I'll touch on that a little later. I am also gonna talk about yeast overgrowth and or allergy to yeast and mold. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about is what I observed myself and with my patients since 1974, um, working with Dr. Atkins. I'm not in clinical practice anymore. I basically do this sort of thing, and I, I am uh, working with the HEAL clinics. But one of the things we started to see in our patients was that a lot of people had yeast and mold reactions, and when they ate those foods, it was a pathway to not losing weight. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on that shortly. Also, other allergies and inflammation. Allergy is an allergic response, an inflammatory response. Your, your immune system is responding to an invader, and you're gonna get swelling, you can get all sorts of things from that, including additional stress on your body. Your body reacts to allergic inflammation in a stressful biochemical fashion. Hormonal changes, um, this can be any number of hormonal changes, and especially common in women because their hormones are changing very frequently. Low thyroid function, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. Yo-yo dieting, um, that's a pattern that you really wanna stop. Even if it means that this becomes difficult, even if your scale progress can be slow, the longer you delay breaking that pattern, the harder it's gonna be, and so, um, Plus, you have the guilt. You, you feel like you're not a good enough person because you can't do this. And yes, you can. Perhaps you just haven't had the right strategies to do it and the right diet. And so um, stopping yo-yo dieting is one of the most important things that I think you can do. Sedentary lifestyle, especially as you age. We start losing our muscle mass actually in our late 20s, early 30s. And every year, if you're sedentary, you lose more and more muscle more and more muscle mass. Now, when you get older, that's not a good thing. Um, you may be weaker, you may have not very good balance, your reflexes may not be so low, you may be more likely to fall, your bones won't be as strong. So if you aren't exercising, just start somewhere, including walking. And exercise is important indirectly to help support your blood sugar and insulin by decreasing insulin resistance. That's why people with diabetes often get better blood sugar control because they're exercising. And the other thing that's important is it, it is a way of coping with stress. And so that's an important piece to the whole thing. Uh, prescription medications, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about these because it's very common that prescription medications will interfere with weight loss. And while I'm waiting for the next slide, um, the other thing that also can happen is most prescription medications can cause depletion of vitamins and nutrients. Um, and sometimes the very um, nutrient you need, one good example are beta blocker drugs, one of the most common drugs prescribed for high blood pressure. And beta blockers increase your excretion of magnesium, and most of us here are deficient in magnesium because our, our soil is deficient in magnesium. Um, and yet, Beta blockers cause excretion of more magnesium, which means that the smooth muscle around your blood vessels can be tighter and your blood pressure can go higher. So, so that's another reason why getting off of a lot of these medications by getting healthy or normalizing your weight is so important. But hormones, hormones can notoriously impact your weight. Depro, Provera are injections, it's a contraceptive, it's given every three months. And I used to have women come in and within the first um, two months of being, have getting their injection, they have gained 10 pounds. 
um, it's notoriously um, suspect for causing weight gain. Birth control pills, some of the more recent ones aren't as bad. The older ones were all an issue. The, and birth control pills can also impact blood sugar and insulin, as can all hormones. And hormone replacement therapy, especially the, the synthetic hormones that were really not meant to be in a woman's body. Um, so that can be a block to your being able to lose. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, people live on those things, take them every day. Um, and that can also be an issue. Psychotropic drugs, and someone asked a question earlier about the SSRIs. Um, many of the older psychotropic drugs really created problems with weight, and some of the newer, very powerful ones um, that are often give, given to kids that are severely schizophrenic. And what they're finding is some of these children within several months gain enough body fat that they become a type 2 diabetic on, their me on that medication. So there's discussion now that when doctors begin to write prescriptions, given how obese our population now is, that you, you should start to think about which drugs are drugs that are less likely to interfere with your ability to lose weight rather than just giving any drug that you're used to prescribing. Um, but someone had asked about the SSRIs. I remember when Prozac came out, and Prozac is a, an SSRI, um, and it was touted that it wasn't only going to treat your depression, but it was going to help you to lose weight. And so for the first six or eight months, we would see people come to the Atkins Center as new patients who were on Prozac. And we took their dietary history. They had actually gained weight since they went on the drug. And now we know that Prozac is one of those drugs that can really help you gain weight or make it harder to lose. Diuretics and other antihypertensives. I just mentioned the beta blockers. Um, they can also interfere with weight loss. Steroids, of course, most of you may be aware of. Steroids are, are cortisol. Um, just like overproduction of your own cortisol may interfere with your weight loss, people who have to take cortisol for severe illnesses for long periods of time will gain weight, and they often are pushed into type 2 diabetes because of the ne negative impact that it has on your blood sugar and on insulin. Um, antibiotics. That we found with our patients as we start to see people who would be losing weight and doing well, and suddenly um, they weren't losing anymore. And we think the pathway would have been what the antibiotic did to the organisms in the gut. Insulin and drugs that elicit an insulin response, same thing. High insulin levels, whether it's your own insulin or from the outside, increased fat deposition. Antihistamines, people live on antihistamines. Um, that can interfere with weight loss. Diet pill rebounds, we don't see as much of that anymore. Um, but, and statin drugs um, certainly can interfere with your weight loss. So get back to basics. If you're, if you're stuck, you get back to basics. And sometimes you need to because if you're someone who is really going along doing really well, you may have gotten overconfident and you started adding carbs back and you may not have chosen the right carbs to add back. So go back to a 20 gram and we recommend a 20 gram total carb intake. And that should help you restabilize everything and get started again. Keep a food diary if you have to. Um, not because I want to know your percentage of this, that, or the other thing, but I can't tell you what I ate for dinner two nights ago. And so if you've been doing a few of the things that you should not to be doing, and you're not writing it down, you're not going to remember. So you're not going to be able to find the mistakes that you've made. So use a food diary. Regular exercise, which I've already mentioned, is important too. When you're regularly exercising, your body's getting toned, you're starting to look a little better, you're fitting into maybe a, 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 a smaller size, if you're in touch with your body like that several times a week with exercising and you notice your energy is better, your sleep is better because of losing weight and exercise, you're less likely to screw it up so easily. Um, so I'm afraid it's a yeast infection. This is the Pillsbury Doughboy. And if you've ever had difficulty with yeast, you do feel pretty much like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Your hands are swell, your belly's sticking out, your head's congested. So we found a lot of our patients had issues with yeast. Now, yeast is normal in the gut. The most common yeast we've talked about is candida. Um, but it can get out of balance. It can get out of balance because you're eating incorrectly and you're feeding it with a lot of high sugar and refined grain products. And when you do that and you become sensitive to yeast, you're going to crave those very foods that you're sensitive to. 
So it's very common in the United States. Um, it's also very common in people with diabetes. And it used to be that a lot of women who got recurring vaginal yeast infections, their GYN doctor would finally say, I think we need to measure blood sugar. You could have diabetes, which is why you have all this yeast. Yeast grows on sugar, it loves it. And so of course, you have to stay off of sugar. It's associated again with a lot of gut dysbiosis. Hormonal preparations can also do that. If you've been on cortisone for a long period of time and some of the other hormones can tend to allow yeast to become more opportunistic and certainly antibiotics. Um, and we took histories, we always took histories to see how many courses of antibiotics did our patients have. Um, and many people have both. They'll have allergy to yeast and mold because they cross-react and they'll also often have overgrowth of the yeast in the gut and you have to deal with both. So symptoms, post-nasal drip, chronic runny nose, sinus headaches, sinusitis, where you often then wind up on antibiotics fairly frequently. Some of our patients would go to their, low, their primary care doctor and they had three doses of antibiotics in the winter. And they were having far more of these chronic symptoms. Um, gas, bloating, and heartburn. Those are often signs of yeast overgrowth. The mucous membranes um, are, are, are too high in, in yeast, a white tongue vaginal erectile itching, vaginal yeast infections. And we saw many women who had yeast allergies, but they really didn't have vaginal yeast. Um, so don't think that you'd have to have that before you had yeast. Uh, water retention, you get puffy, your hands swell. Um, oh, yeah, joy. <laughs> okay, spaciness and brain fog. That's a real common symptom of brain sensitivity or allergy. Constipation or diarrhea. Some people will get constipated, others, others have frequent diarrhea. Skin eruptions, itchiness, uh, uticaria, um, those are also signs, can be signs of yeast activity. And one of the things I would ask people that we suspected having yeast is, <clears throat> when you go off your diet, what foods do you go for? And a lot of times, not always, it would be bread, pizza, alcohol, because those are all high yeast foods. And what's your favorite salad dressing? A lot of times people would say blue cheese. I can sit near blue cheese and I start getting itchy already. <laughs> so improvements on a yeast-free plan. First of all, it may improve your weight loss. Um, may, and certainly you want to get a decrease in your original symptoms. You want less cravings. Oftentimes you will crave what you're sensitive to and what makes you sick. So sometimes that's a, 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 tra a, a trigger or uh, um, gives you the idea, if you keep a food diary, um, you could find out which foods you might need to eliminate and test and see how you feel. You're much more alert. You have much more physical energy. Less PMS symptoms. Yeast can get more active as your hormone changes premenstrually. But once you start to calm those down, you do have less PMS symptoms. Decrease in urinary symptoms. You know, that whole area can get allergically inflamed and then you get frequency and urgency and all sorts of things decrease in itching, vaginal discharge. Um, and less, you often can become, once you've treated some of the yeast issues, you can become less reactive to some of your other environmental allergies because your system is just less stressed. Now, there are yeast-restricted foods, and we would test people um, and put them on a yeast-free diet for four to six weeks. And you could try this too if you think if you have any of these symptoms that might be related. Um, certainly you're off of things with sugars and grains, or at least you should be, if you're doing a low-carb ketogenic diet. No alcohol. Alcohol is fermented. No fruit. Fruit is liquid sugar, especially dried fruit will really trigger yeast. Juices, um, cheese. Now, we would have people who were not who are not exquisitely sensitive, so we would allow them to have a small amount of either cream cheese or mozzarella because it's a fresher cheese. But we had some people, we took them off all dairy. Mushrooms, that's a big one. Vinegar, um, I just use olive oil on my salad. I went on a yeast-restricted diet years ago, and I never resumed vinegar. Be careful with sour cream, stop it for a while. Soy sauce, anything fermented and pickled, you stay off of it for four to six weeks, and you see what happens to your symptoms. And if they go away, then you should really stay on it a bit longer and give your body a chance to adjust to being off of all those foods. And then when you add things back, you add them back very, very carefully. 
Now, low thyroid function is another reason why you may have difficulty with your weight. And this is very much underdiagnosed, and especially in women and in people with type 2 diabetes. It's not uncommon as women start getting perimenopausal. All of your hormones are interrelated, and as they start to get out of balance, that can also affect your thyroid. Um, so my advice is when you're younger and you're healthier, get a, a, a thyroid panel, which what we did was free T3, free T4, TSH, and autoantibodies. So you have a baseline to compare later if you start having difficulty. And oftentimes it's missed because thyroid problems can start slowly. So these symptoms are insidious, and maybe year after year you have just another symptom, and you don't, you don't get acutely ill with something like this. Um, at least not usually. And so it, it can be hard to, to keep track of and to diagnose if you're not paying attention. <clears throat> now, and often your lab values are normal. And we'd already talked here how just because a, a lab falls into normal, either high normal or low normal, how do you know for you what your optimum level is going to be? And I, I have seen a lot of patients where we would see that their TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, when you, your pituitary gland senses that your thyroid is too slow, you begin to produce thyroid-stimulating hormone to, to kind of give it a kick in the butt and get moving, make more hormone. Um, and the normal, really normal value should only be three. Many labs will tell you 4.5 to 5 is normal. But if you're someone whose TSH is 4.5 and you have symptoms, which I'll review in a few minutes, that doesn't mean that your body is functioning optimally if you have those symptoms. And you would probably do better with a lower TSH. I remember, um, especially in women, because as you get older, if you are hypothyroid and it isn't treated, you are at increased risk for cardiovascular disease. And my mother had a doctor um, who, she had a TSH of 4.5, and she had many symptoms of low thyroid. And the doctor said, well, it's not abnormal enough for me to treat you. And so it was really the lab test he was looking at only and never reviewed her symptoms. And that's, to me, if that's what you're doing, you've lost the art of medicine. The art of medicine is really not relying simply on numbers on a sheet, but looking at your patient, learning from them. And so what we would do at the Atkins Center if they had a lot of symptoms is we would give them a small dose of thyroid. We would explain what the side effects would be if we gave them too much and they should call us up uh, and we deal with it. But we found many people who were doing much, much better and their symptoms eventually went away. So that's one to not overlook. Um, and what's often used in the United States is Synthroid, which is a, a brand name of the um, generic T4 which is the stored hormone that your body has to convert in your liver to T3. Oftentimes, that doesn't happen, and yet doctors often won't measure anything other than T4. And so you could be missing a lot by not doing a full panel. Other hormone imbalances like estrogen dominance, which I talked about in other le lectures, um, can also block your thyroid. Now, symptoms of hypothyroid, and these are some of the major ones. There are others. Fatigue, of course constipation, um, you feel sensitive to cold, everybody else is fine and you're cold, weight gain, edema, <clears throat> uh, that is part of what can um, account for some of the weight gain, increased cholesterol and depression. Um, and what, what happens is if your cholesterol is increased, your doctor doesn't check your thyroid to make sure it's working, he get, reaches for a statin prescription. So you really, that's a Band-Aid and you're not getting to the underlying reason why you have, may have a high cholesterol. Depression, I read once a number of years ago that about 35% of people who are depressed put on an antidepressant who don't get better are depressed because they had hypothyroidism and the, and, and the prescription medication for depression was not the answer. So anyone before you get treated for the first time, I think for depression should have an adequate thyroid panel to rule that out as a cause of your depression. Thinning hair, um, hair loss, irregular uh, or heavy menstrual periods, um, hoarseness. Now, I'm a little hoarse because I have allergies. Um, my thyroid is fine, so I just want to let you know that. Um, poor memory, muscle weakness, dry skin, dry hair, peeling nails, um, all can be a sign of low thyroid function. And if you're hypothyroid and you become pregnant, 
um, that is a risk to, to the fetus uh, that can have some very negative um, results in that child because you had a hormonal imbalance that wasn't treated. So have realistic expectations, and this is one of the hardest things for people to get. What I found is I've done a lot of, well, I don't know how many dietary histories I've done over the 30 years that I worked with Dr. Atkins in, in clinical practice, but when I asked people why they failed on a diet, why did you give up? It was because they had these expectations that were often written in stone, and if that diet didn't meet their expectations, they would give up and they would gain more weight, and then eventually they would try another diet. And never occurred to them that maybe it's my expectations that are inaccurate, and maybe that's what I really need to look at. So I encourage you that if you fall into that pattern and you carry these expectations with you, especially the expectation of how the scale should change when you're on a diet. The scale does not gradually go down week after week nice and even. We all love that to happen, but that's not how it works. Because when you're getting on the scale, you are measuring a lot of different things. You're measuring fluid balance, you're measuring salt retention. If you're on medications that may interfere with weight loss, you're look, you, what you're measuring is the side effect of the medication. Um, if you're losing lean mass, if you're losing muscle mass because you're too sedentary or because you're not maintaining muscle mass by being active, um, yes, you may be losing weight, but we don't, that's not the tissue we want you to lose. Remember, we want you to lose fat. And we know from the studies that have been done on carbohydrate restriction that there is a lot less loss of lean mass as you lose weight than there is on a low-calorie, low low-fat diet. So low-calorie, low-fat, you may have lost the same weight as the person did at the end of the study on low-fat, but when they looked at body composition, it was often different. Men will have an easier time losing ladies. You just have to accept that. Um, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so don't compare to your boyfriends or your husbands or anyone else. Um, deal with what your metabolism will do. If you're more stressed, you need to find a stress reliever that is not related to food. So if you're very stressed and you have a comfort food you go to, that is a pattern that you need to break. So find something else not related to food. And there's lots of things out there yoga and Pilates and, and just take your dog out for a walk or let your dog walk you, uh, anything like that. Um, but find a stress reliever. If certain medications are necessary, then it's necessary for you to adjust what your weight loss goals are. You may have to accept if you've had an accident and a severe injury or illness and you're still taking some cortisol that your doctor is trying to get you off of, um, just forget the scale for a while. Just eat correctly. And once you do that, there's a better chance you're going to start to bounce back once that medication is gone. <clears throat> Be realistic about your weight loss goals. Again, follow inches, not the scale. And, you know, if you're a postmenopausal woman, your body shape is going to change. You redistribute fat. And you may actually wear a larger size than you did when you were a teenager. But if you're just, if you're just as healthy in that larger size, then that's what's important, and you want to be on a, a food plan where you can have a wide variety of foods and still maintain your loss. Getting down by another five or six or seven pounds isn't necessarily going to make you healthier and can actually make you more frustrated. So remember, you're in this for the long run. <clears throat> and you want to enhance your health because if it's only about weight, the way our lives are nowadays, what we can wind up doing is something else in your life can become more important than losing weight. And so if that's your only goal, I'm not worried about that right now. I'm having trouble at work. I'm too stressed. I'll worry about it later after everything calms down. But if you include your health in all of this, that's an additional motivation for at least most of us to continue to stay on the program that's making you feel better. So it's not just a diet, but a lifestyle. And this is about the only way I think you should use a scale. I can't believe I was doing it wrong all these years. So by relying on your scale, you're doing it wrong all these years. So thank you. Um, I don't know, do I have time? You're way over time, so we gotta oh, end it okay. now. Thank you, Jackie Eberstein.